Love you and give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, here in Isaiah chapter number 53, this chapter is known as the suffering servant. It's known as the suffering servant. I want to begin reading there in verse number one. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And then it says this. I want to focus on this verse and this concept. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Tonight I'm going to be preaching about dealing with rejection. Dealing with rejection. Dealing or living with the fact of people despising you. The fact of people hating you. Now I want to begin by saying this. Our great ex greatest example, the greatest example to all Christians is who, of whom we are named after. Christians is Christ, of course. And Christ is someone that we can relate to on this level. That's actually what this whole entire chapter is about. It is termed as, or known as, the suffering servant chapter. And one of the ways that Jesus, God as a man, was described in verse number 3, it says this, and let this sink in. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. That is strong language. So this is not something that Christ is immune from. This is something that all people, that all people will have to deal with in their life. And with Christ, we have a companion. Now, when Job was suffering, he told the men that came to him, the three men, he told them, what miserable comforters are ye all, right? So there's a saying that, that, that goes, misery loves company. And the greatest thing to help you get through a hard time, the greatest thing when you're hated and you're despised and you're rejected and you're looked down upon by others is really to have company. It's to have a companion in all of this. And isn't it wonderful that our God became a man and he can relate to you in every way and in the fullest sense on what it means to be rejected and Amen. to be despised and to be hated and to be a man of sorrows right. and acquainted with grief. That's very strong language. We go over to Psalm chapter number 22. Psalm chapter number 22. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 22. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, there's also immediate applications that apply to David. He, of course, can relate to this as well. Begin in verse number 1. It says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Look at verse number 6. But I am a worm. And no man. And then it says, a reproach of men. Reproach is, is something that is like a sore thumb. It's a, it's a negative in your life and people will look down upon you. That's what he's saying. He's a reproach of men. He's a reproach of men. They look down upon him. It's like someone that is despised or rejected. And look at what it says after, after that. So a reproach of men, and then it says, and despised of the people. Now, of course, in ways this relates to David with the immediate application. But who is this a prophecy of? Who fulfilled everything that's in this chapter? The Lord Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, right? And we see here another passage where it's talking about him being despised of the people. Look at verse number 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breath. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is mel melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue 
cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Turn the New Testament to Mark chapter number 8, verse number 31. We see there an inside look of what it what it was like for the Lord Jesus Christ to go through the sufferings of the cross, to go through the sufferings of being despised, rejected by the nation of Israel. See that he is someone that we can relate to when speaking of being despised, being rejected. This is something, like I said, that, that no one is immune from in this life. You know, it is... You're setting your child up, especially for failure, if you teach your child that life is all rainbows and unicorns. There's a lot of sadness in life. There's a lot of sorrow in life. There's a lot of hard times in life. You know what you need to do is you need to find a way to be strong enough and to get over it. That's what you need. Amen. And you know what? The best way is to find companions that can help you get over this. Now, companions, and we're going to go over this, companions as far as friends, Companions as far as people that are at the church. Companions of even looking to the prophets of the Old Testament. People that can relate to you. But the greatest person that we can relate to, the person that's going to help you the most, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at Mark chapter number 8, verse number 31. It says this, And he began to teach them, <clears throat> and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And then it says this, And be rejected of the elders of the chief priests and and uh, I'm sorry, and of uh, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. I want you to turn to John chapter number seven, verse number seven. John chapter number seven, verse number seven. John chapter number one. I'm going to read to you quickly. It says in verse ten and eleven, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse eleven, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. Once you look at John chapter number 7, verse number 7. John chapter number 7, verse number 7. Jesus says this, The world cannot hate you, but me it hated, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ knows and understands what it's like to be hated. He knows and he understands what it's like to be despised. He knows and understands what it's like to be rejected. And I want you to think about this. He came, as it says, unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, that applies, of course, to the Jews. You know, I believe you could put a double application on that, of course, and say that, you know, he came to save his people because he's the God of those people, right? But, of course, he also came unto who? The Jews. He came unto his family members. I'm sure he had a lot of cousins. That rejected him and despised him and hated him. I'm sure he had a lot of family members, albeit you, you know, we would we're just we're just guessing. But I, I would almost guarantee that he had a lot of family members that were cousins, that were maybe uncles, that were maybe nephews. They may have even been in the crowd with the Israelites when they were screaming out, crucify him, crucify him. But either way you look at it, he came unto his own, and his own received his not. He came unto those that were of his same blood, that were of his same tribe, that were of his same nation, and they rejected him, they despised him. The Bible says they hated him. They hated him. So if there's, you know, really, it's, 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 it's the greatest thing in the world that we can relate to the Lord Jesus Christ, that our God, we can re that he can relate to us, and we can relate to him, and he knows what it's like to be hated and rejected. But what makes it, makes him even a greater comforter is that you will never be hated and rejected like he was either. He doesn't only know what it's like on a human level to be despised and rejected. He knows what it's like on a level that you will never experience. On, on a level that you will never attain unto, and I'm sure it's not a goal of yours, right? But he knows what it's like to a level that you will never understand, of what it's like to be hated and rejected. I want you to go to uh, Nehemiah chapter number 4. Let's look at some of the Old Testament prophets who also uh, experienced this, were hated and rejected by the world and the many. Nehemiah chapter number 4. I want you to look at verse number 4. I'm just going to read a couple of isolated verses throughout the Old Testament quickly. Nehemiah chapter number 4, verse number 4, it says this, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. 
speaking on behalf of the nation of Israel, of course, and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of iniquity. Go to Job chapter number 19. So we see that Nehemiah understood what it was like to be hated and to be despised. Go to Job chapter number 19. Being a perfect example is Job, who had everything at one point and then lost everything. And he talks about how he's looked down upon, how he's hated, he's despised. Look at Job chapter number 19. Look at verse number 8. It says this, He hath fenced up my way. I got the wrong verse here. Job 19. Okay, we're going to have to skip this. I don't know where it's at. Go to Psalm chapter number 119. It's verse 18. I'll read to you real quick, but just go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter number 119, verse 141. He just mentions being despised. He says, Yay, young children despise me. I arose and they spake against me. So we can see Job, who was a great man, is now in a state of which he's being mocked by children. Saying he is being looked down upon in the, the greatest form. Even children are not mocking him. Look at Psalm chapter number 119. Look at verse number 141. 141. Psalm 119, verse 141, it says this. I am small and despised. And he says, yes, do not I. Do not I forget thy precepts. I want you to go to the New Testament now. We'll look at the apostles. <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. This is Paul's writing, of course. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. We can look at all of the persecutions and all of the, the affliction that Paul went through. And I'm sure also, again, we'll never experience the things that he went through in that regard. But I want you to look at how he speaks of the apostles and how they were treated and how they were looked at by the world. So we see here, Jesus said also by the world that he was hated and that the world hated him. Now look at the apostles. It says this in 1 Corinthians 4. Let's begin reading in verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that he might learn us, that he might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst not receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou had, hast not received it? Verse 8, now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings with us, and I would to God he did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth, forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. And then he says, for we are made a spectacle unto the world. What's a spectacle? When well, you think of like the word spectator, it's something to look at. Now, we'll see here in just a moment, he's not saying that this is something that people are watching because they look at him in a good light, or they look at him in a pleasurable way, but rather they're looking at him, and the world's looking at the apostles and mocking them and despising them and hating them. Look at what it says there, <clears throat> the end of verse 9, and to angels and to men, look at verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Verse 11. Even unto this present hour, speaking about the apostles, we are both hunger, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Verse 13. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made, watch this. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. Now, if you look there at verse number 13, that is, that's, like I said about Isaiah 53, that is strong language. That is very derogatory language to speak of yourself. He says, being defamed, we entreat. And then he says, we are made as the filth of the world. If you wanted to call somebody the worst thing, what would you say? They are the filth of the world. What are you saying? They're the worst possible thing that could exist on this planet, aren't you? They're the filth of the world. They're the worst of the worst is what you're saying. The apostles, Paul, all of them were looked at as being the filth of the world. They weren't loved by the world. When you have a Christianity that tries to tell you that once you convert to Christianity, everybody's going to love you, that's false Christianity. Right. 
you're doing something wrong. If everybody loves you and everybody accepts you and you're never having any trouble, especially in light of the world, from the world, something's wrong. The apostles were hated. What happened to Jesus? He came. He wasn't loved. Jesus was hated. Jesus was taken. He was rejected. He was despised. This modern Jesus is another Jesus. This modern Jesus that people are preaching in these new evangelical churches that is all love, he's all peace, the whole world would agree with that Jesus. That's not the Jesus that came 2,000 years ago. That's not the Jesus that's seated in heaven. The Jesus that came to this earth was rejected and hated by the world. That's why they created a new Jesus. This modern world today, they already rejected and hated Jesus. That's why they had to make a new Jesus that they liked. We as Christians, if you are being loved by the world, there's a problem. That's not right. I want, you know, Paul talked about, be followers of me even as I am of Christ. So your life should be similar to that of Paul's. I mean, you don't have to, of course, you know, carry the same routine and, 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 the, and the, 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 the hard life that he lives in that regard. But if you are following the same principles and the same values that he was following, you should not be loved by the world. You should be hated by the world. You shouldn't strive for that, but that is the ultimate outcome of living the life of a Christian, of following Christ. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. They hated Christ, and they hated Paul. Why? Because Paul was following Christ. If they are going to hate Christ, and Paul lives like Christ, what are they, how are they going to treat Paul? They're going to hate him as well. So if you're following Paul, if you're following the apostles, would it make sense that you're loved by the world when they were hated by the world? No, it's the ultimate outcome. It is the outcome of living a life as a Christian. You're going to be hated. So he says they're they're, they're considered the filth of the world. And then he says, and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. And offscurring is like, it's like the filth. It's another way of saying it. It's like the dirtiness and the nastiness like on your plate after you've eaten something. What you would scrape off your plate. That's what it means to scur something. Go to Lamentations chapter number 3. Lamentations chapter number three. I may need some. I, I, I forgot to look this up and I just realized it. But this is actually a quotation. I remember that. And I don't have it written down here. Let's see if I can find it. This is a, that was actually a quotation from 1 Corinthians chapter number three. It's actually quoted here. And this chapter, of course, has to be a massive chapter with 66 verses in it. Somebody look up the word offscurring if you don't mind. It's, it's in Lamentations chapter number 3. Keep your hand here so we don't put a halt to the entire sermon. And go ahead and keep your hand here and turn to Luke chapter number 6 as well. 45. Luke 6, 26. What is it? Verse 45. Verse 45. So here in Lamentations chapter number 3, verse number 45, we see that the prophets and Israel were treated in the exact same way. It says in verse 45, Thou hast made us as the offscurring, and then he says this, and refuse in the midst of the people. Now, what did it say in 1 Corinthians? It says that they were the filth and the offscurring. Now, what is refuse? It's that which is rejected. It's, the, it's what no one wants. It's just like what Jesus Christ, what it talked about about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53. What was it? He was despised and he was rejected of men. He was, he was like, he was treated what? Like the refused. He was treated like Jesus Christ was treated like the filth of the world. Let that sink in. Go to Luke chapter number 6, verse number 26. Luke chapter number 6, verse number 26. Now, some people will, some people are hated by the world because they desire to be hated by the world. And they bring this about because that's what they want. That shouldn't be your goal. Like, I'm going to make sure the world hates me. It, sh- it will be the outcome of just living a Christian life, but you shouldn't be just hated by everyone just because you're a jerk, just because you're rude, just because you're a punk, going around being a punk to everybody. You know, it will be the outcome of living a Christ-like life, but it shouldn't be your goal. Like, it shouldn't be step one, hated by the world, check. That's not how it's supposed to work. It's live your life like Paul, live your life like Christ, and if you are doing that, do you know how you'll be treated? You'll be the refused. You'll be the filth. You'll be the offscoring. You'll be hated, just like he was. But it shouldn't be like that's what you're striving for. So look here in Luke chapter number 6, verse number 26. It says this, Luke 6, 26. Woe unto you when all men 
shall speak well of you. And then it says, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Go to John chapter number 15. John chapter number 15. When we look around at all of these, these phony preachers like Benny Hinn and, and uh, Joel Osteen and all of these people that are just loved by the world, of course they're preaching a false gospel, so we can see like they're, they're not saved, of course, just from that angle. But we can see that one of the identifiers of a false prophet, prophet, false prophet, a false prophet is being, being loved by everyone. Do you know why? Because you're not really preaching the Bible. That's why. Because you're just telling people what they want to hear. Look at John chapter number 15, verse number 18. John chapter number 15, verse number 18. It says this, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, I want you to, to understand the purpose of, of this statement is actually meant to be comforting. He's telling you that, hey, if the world hates you, I want you to know. Read it one more time. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. He's actually trying to tell you and comfort you like, hey. When you get to the point where you realize that everyone hates you, that the world hates you, that no one likes you, that you're treated like filth, like off screen, like refused, that you're rejected and despised of men, just keep in mind that the world hated me too. That I came in the same way in which everyone despises you and hates you and wants nothing to do with you. They talk bad about you. Know that they did the same thing about me. Isn't that comforting? To know, I mean, what greater example is there than Christ? And he went through the exact same thing. Go to uh, Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 22. Now, if we're trying to be like Christ, it sounds like that's a good thing. If the world hates you. Go to Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 22. Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 22. 10, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 22. Matthew 10, 22 reads, And ye shall be hated... So he's prophesying, saying, this will happen. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Of course, the prophecy of the tribulation saying that those that are Christians are going to be hated for the name of Christ because they live as a Christian, right? Go to Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 10. Just go back. Couple of pages, go back to Matthew 5, verse 10. It says this Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11 Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, that's like mocking, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12 Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets, were for before you. Now, there's a couple of things in this, this verse. Number one, he says, if you are mocked and ridiculed, that can be, of course, disheartening, can it? It can be discouraging. The majority of people, what's the natural reaction? If the natural reaction is to be discouraged, is to be disheartened. But what does Christ say that you should do? He says that you should rejoice. If we look this up in a parallel passage in Luke, it says that you should leap for joy. That's extreme excitement, right? He says you shouldn't be discouraged. Be happy that this is happening. And you know what else he says? You know what he's doing? He's giving you a companion. Misery loves company. He says they did the same thing to the prophets. So not only do we have Christ as our companion, not only do we have Paul and all the apostles as our companion, we also have the prophets of the Old Testament. They were all hated. They were all persecuted. The majority of them were killed for what they believed and what they preached and what they taught and the way in which they lived their lives. So you see, what you see is you see all these companions. And he ends up saying, this is a good thing. That shows that you're doing something right. If you are loved by everyone, that's a red flag. If you're hated, well, they hated me too. So that makes perfect sense. That means you're probably living your life or trying to live your life as close as you can to my life. I want you to go to uh, 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 13. We'll see this again. 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 13. First John chapter number 3, look at verse number 13. It says this, 
Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. What does he mean, marvel not? Don't wonder at this. Don't be surprised by this. A lot of people will even say, those that, that uh, you know, 99% of the time or 90% of the time that aren't saved, that aren't really church, that don't know the Bible well, when they see a church that's attacked and hated, they'll ask the question like, you know, if you guys are in the truth, why does everyone hate you so much? But they don't realize the Bible actually teaches from beginning to end that this is the product of being in the truth. Of actually being a Bible-believing church of someone that actually is following Christ. Of someone that actually is a child of God and living their life the way in which God wants you to. The product of that is being hated, not loved. So you know what he says? Marvel not. Because people tend to what? They tend to, to marvel about that. Like, if you're in the truth, why does everyone hate you? Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Go to, uh, go to Psalm chapter number 41, verse number 9. I'm going to talk about something that, of course, everyone here can relate to uh, as well. Not only the world hating you, that can be easy. But when it becomes hard are when friends hate you. Or when people that you love. And more, even more so, people, not just friends in general, not just worldly friends, but those that you have the strongest connection with are what? Spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that you love the most, those that you are the closest to the most, should be Christians. They should be brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. So what hurts the most is when someone who is a spiritual brother, a spiritual sister in Christ, those that you have the strongest relationship with, when someone like that turns on you. Go to, as I said, uh, what, what, where did I say first? Psalm 41, nine. Okay, gotcha. Psalm, yeah, we're going to look first. We're going to look at a couple of passages here in Psalms, the book of Psalms. The first one would be Psalm chapter number 41, verse number 9. Psalm chapter number 41, verse number 9. We're going to see that David related very much so with us in this area. Psalm chapter number 41, verse number 9. It says this, Yea, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted. So this is a person that he says is a familiar friend. Saying he's a close friend, and it's someone who he trusted, who was close to him. My own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So what is this? This is he's discussing the betrayal from a friend, isn't he? He's discussing being hurt, being turned upon on by what? By a friend, by a close friend, someone he ate with, someone he would consider probably a brother, could be even speaking of his own son, he turned on him. That's a perfect example. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 38. Psalm chapter number 38, just go over a couple of chapters. Psalm chapter number 38, verse number 10. It says this, my heart panteth, my strength faileth. My strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. And he says in verse number 11, My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sword. They, are, they want nothing to do with them. And then he says, And my kinsmen, that's like his family, stand afar off. So what's he saying? what is he explaining again? He's saying that all of his friends and all of his family have left him. They've turned against him. They're not with him. They don't want anything to do with him. They're treating him how? Like the filth of the world. They're treating him like what? Like the all scarring. They want nothing to do. He's refused. He's been despised and rejected. Go to Psalm 31, verse 11. Notice this is something that is a common occurrence throughout the writings of David. He can very much relate to being rejected, being despised, not only by the world, but also by his friends, also by his, his close brothers. Look at Psalm chapter number 31. Look at verse number 11. I was a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors. Now, if you study the word neighbor in the Bible, it oftentimes is used interchangeable with brother. So he says, but especially among my neighbors, and a fear to my acquaintance. They that, they that did see me without fled from me. So notice it's coming up over and over again where he mentions first he's a reproach among his, among his uh, enemies, but then he says, and especially, even more so, among his friends, his neighbors, his acquaintances. They want nothing to do with him. It says they fled from him. They want to stay far away from him. How is he being treated? He's despised and he's rejected, isn't he? Go to Psalm chapter number 55. Psalm chapter number 55. So this is found all over the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter number 55. 
Look at verse number 12. Psalm chapter number 55, verse number 12, it says this. For it, this is a powerful verse. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Now, if you would remember the statement I made a minute ago that it's not, you know, it can be hard. Maybe if you're not used to it, maybe if you just have never experienced rejection or, or, or hate or someone despising you, maybe it can be hard to be hated by the world to begin with. You know, you can get over it. It's not that big of a deal. If, you know, when an enemy, someone that you, you know, like a sodomite, all of these people, he's like, you know what? If they hated me, I could have borne it. I could have carried it. I could have dealt with it. I could have just, I could have just gotten over it. Right? That's what he's saying. For it, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Then he says this. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then he says then I would have hid myself from him. Verse 13, but it was thou, but it was thou, a man, my equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, watch this, and I walked unto the house of God in company. Notice that verse. Who is this person? It's a fellow Christian, isn't it? It's someone that he says that they go to the house of God. What would we equate that to today? You know what the house of God is referred to as? The church. So it's someone that what? That went to church with David. Someone that was a brother or sister in Christ. Someone that was a fellow worshiper of the God of Israel. You would relate that to a brother or sister in Christ that attended maybe the same church as you. Go to Isaiah chapter number 53. So we can see that David knows exactly what it's like to be rejected by other brothers and sisters in Christ. To be hated, to be despised, for them even to go so far as to hurt them hurt him or to kill him, turn to Isaiah chapter number 53 again. Now, I want you to see this one more time, that Jesus knew what it was like not only to be hated by the world as we saw, but he knew what it was like to be hated by his brothers and by his sisters. Look at Isaiah chapter number 53. Look at verse number 3. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I want you to notice the... the uh, what, what tense this is in, the, the, the person that this is being spoken at from, the perspective. It says this, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Do you notice the perspective that's being spoken from? First person, plural. Who's writing? Isaiah. Who's speaking about this? It's those that are acquaintances, those that are you know, brothers, if you will, uh, maybe fellow Israelites, however you want to apply this specifically to the Old Testament scripture, I would say that it's those that are saved. That's what I would say, and I'm going to show you why I believe that in just a moment. But it's, it's those that relate to Christ. They're not people just far off. This passage is not about the world hating him. It's about those that he came to save rejecting him. It says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and look what it says, and we esteemed him not. So he was rejected and hated when he was on the cross. He was rejected and hated when the soldiers took him. And did anybody care for him or try to help him? That, this may cross people, this may just go over your head. This might not cross people's minds. But I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 31. But he was, for, he was forsaken by all of his followers. He was forsaken by all of those that followed him for this period of time, for the three and a half years while he you know, was uh, in his ministry. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 31. It says, this, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me. This night. Now watch what it says. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So we're going to look further at this in just a moment. But what he's explaining, we're going to read further into this chapter as well. But what he's explaining is somebody's going to come. You know, people are going to come. Of course, we know they, they come and they arrest him. And he's saying that you're going to be offended in me when they, when, when they actually take me. You're going to be offended in me, and you're not going to stay with me. They're going to smite the shepherd. And then all of you are just going to leave me. All of you are just going to forsake me. All of you, no one's going to, you know, we see Peter who, who tries to put up a fight initially. 
And he's the one that's the most zealous in this passage. Look at verse number 32, zealous about staying with Christ. It says in verse 32, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Now look at verse 33. Peter answered and said to him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Verse 34. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Does that sound familiar? He's talking about how he was despised and rejected of men. And then what does it say? We hid as it were our faces from him. It says, you know, that he was despised and we esteemed him not. Look at verse 35. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also, also said, look at this, all the disciples. So what are they saying? We're not going to deny you. We're not going to leave you. We're not going to forsake you. I want you to turn to, go to uh, Mark chapter number 14 now. Mark chapter number 14. So we're going to look at the, the account of when Peter denies him. Look at Mark chapter number 14, a longer chapter. Uh, look at the end of the chapter, verse number 66. It says this, And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. So he denied him, of course, at this time once, goes on, and a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. Verse 70, and he, had, and he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. Verse 71, but he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. Look at verse 72. And the second time, the cock crew, and it says, And Peter called to mind the words that Jesus said to him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And, he, and, and when he thought thereon, he wept. Now keep your hand here and go over to Luke chapter number 22. So there's a little element of the story that's not mentioned in Mark chapter number 14. That's mentioned in Luke chapter number 22. In Mark chapter number 14, it says in verse number 72, just to remind you, and the second time the cock crew, and Peter, it says this, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Now, Luke chapter number 22 actually tells you why he thought thereon. Look at Luke chapter number 22. I want you to look at verse number 61. So it says this, look at verse 60 first. <laughs> Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. Now, doesn't he look, no, didn't he sound pretty emboldened when he was speaking to Jesus earlier? Didn't he sound pretty confident? Like, I would never deny you. I would never be ashamed of you. Though I'll die with you. And then what happens? He, he's put in a predicament, and what is he? He's ashamed of the name of Jesus, isn't he? He's ashamed of Christ. What does he do? He tries to put himself in the same category as them, doesn't he? I, I don't know who this guy is. I don't care about this guy. He's trying to distance himself from Jesus, isn't he? Why? He's, of course, afraid and scared, but the Bible says that he was offended. He's ashamed of him because he doesn't want to have anything to do with what's going on right now. He's ashamed of what's happening, and he's scared that he could be put into that same boat. Now, look at what the Bible actually says in Luke chapter number 22. Look at verse 61. Let's read again verse 16 and 61 in tandem. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And then it says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, <clears throat> Excuse me, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me. Right. So notice what it actually was that brought to memory or brought to mind the words that Jesus had said. In Mark chapter number 14, the cock crows, and all it says is that Peter remembered. You compare that to Luke chapter number 22, and do you know what actually brought it to memory? Jesus was standing there while he was watching his disciples. I don't know who this guy is. I have nothing to do with him. He's, I'm not his follower. Quit saying that. And he starts to curse and to swear and do what? And reject him. A perfect fulfillment of Isaiah chapter number 53 when it says, We hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
So Jesus stood there, and Peter was obviously oblivious of, oblivious, oblivious of this the entire time, that Jesus was actually watching what was going on, while Peter stood there and swore up and down and rejected and despised and what? And, you know, he was off screen. I want nothing to do with him. Well, how is he treated? He's treated like the refused. Now, a lot of people will just look at Peter here, and they'll, they'll sympathize with Peter. Because it says in verse 62, we have the strong language is only given in Luke. The other passages will tell you that he wept, but Luke actually says, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. I feel sorry for Peter. You know, I feel bad for him that he's a man. What he did was wrong, but he obviously felt remorse about this, didn't he? When he saw Jesus and he knew what he had done, he felt bad about what he had done. But sometimes we forget that Jesus, yeah, he's fully God, but he's fully man. How do you think Jesus felt when he's just standing there watching one of his closest friends, one of his best friends, one of the people that he handpicked to follow him for three and a half years, and he's watching this man just stand there, screaming up and down, cursing, I don't have anything to do with him, I want nothing to do with this guy, I don't know who he is, and just despising him and rejecting him. How do you think Jesus felt? And I mean, I, I can understand why Peter would feel that also when then he turns around and the person who, you know, of you who you admire, which is a mild word to use, it was watching you do this the entire time. But you know what that, you know what that actually, you know what you can learn from this passage? That makes Jesus, when you can fully understand what's going on, that makes Jesus that much more of a companion. That makes, that, that kind of shows you the reality that Jesus went through as God as a man, it shows you the experience, actually what he experienced as a man while he sat there and watched one of his own disciples who he trained, whom he loved, whom he handpicked, just despise and reject and treat him like what? Filth, the all scurrying of the world? Wanted nothing to do with him? And he had to sit there and watch that. And you know, of course, Peter being a good example, he went out and wept bitterly. But it just shows the extremity of what Christ went through. The, you know, he was hated and rejected by the Pharisees. Do you think that really mattered to him as much as Peter doing that? What do you think he cared the most about? I mean, that's a joke of a question, isn't it? What hurt him the most, do you think? He's not just a robot. He was really a man. He cried. He wept at times while he was alive. He hungered. He thirsted. He became weary and faint. He was a real man. And how do you think it felt to him when he saw one of his friends being, you know, uh, uh, slanderous towards him, cursing and swearing and rejecting and despising him also, along with all of those other people that would be, he came unto his own and his own received him not. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 15. There's such a powerful verse. You know, misery loves company, and we have the greatest companion in misery that we could ever imagine. We have Jesus Christ, who is the comforter himself. Look at Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 15. It says this, For we have not an high priest, speaking of Jesus, our high priest, which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmity. Saying he knows what it's like. He knows the weaknesses, the hard times, the sorrows. He knows what it's like to be despised. He knows what it's like to be rejected. But it says, and then it says this, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Not only was Jesus despised and rejected and hated by the world, but he knows what it's like to be despised and to be rejected and hated by brethren, by other brothers and sisters. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 66. We're going to end here. Isaiah chapter number 66. I want you to look at verse number 5. It says this in Isaiah chapter number 66, verse number 5. It says, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Or, I'm sorry, hear the word of the Lord. Ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, they cast you out for my name's sake. This verse, of, of all verses, obviously encapsulates what took place to everyone in this room. 
Let's read it one more time. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified. Now watch this. But he shall appear to your joy. I want you to notice that. So they think they're doing the right thing. They're taking their brethren, and they hate their brother in Christ. They hate the one that they're actually casting out for what? For my name's sake. Maybe the name of Jesus. Maybe that's the reason why they're being cast out. What did Matthew chapter number 5 say? To rejoice when you suffer persecution for my name's sake. Amen. And right here, if you look at it in Matthew 5 and you think, oh, this is the world doing it to you. This is just the world doing it to you. No, it's either one. It doesn't have to be the world. Jesus was hated by the world, and he was also despised and rejected by the Israelites. And he was also looked down upon and was despised and rejected by Peter. It doesn't have to be the world. It says, hear the word of the, of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said. So this is what they said. Let the Lord be glorified. So again, they think that what they are doing is right. They think that this is God's will, that they're in the will of God, and that they're casting out you know, the wicked people. But look at this. But he shall appear to your joy. Isn't that comforting? Amen. But he shall appear to your joy. Now watch this. And they shall be ashamed. So when we look at the Bible, we have the companion of many people. We have the companion of the apostles. We have the companion of the Old Testament prophets. We have the companions of, of you know, many, many people that wouldn't even fall into those categories. You could speak, think of many people. I mean, you have Nehemiah. You have so many people that were treated poorly and badly. For why? For the name of Christ. But the two greatest things about being mistreated, about being rejected, about being despised is, number one, the person that I go to in prayer knows exactly what that's like, like, exactly what that's like on a level that I could never even understand, right. on a much larger level. The, the person that I go to for help and I go to to pray to and to ask for help, he knows exactly what that's like. And you know what? It's true. Misery loves company. And that helps a lot when he knows what it's like to be miserable. He knows what it's like to be sad or sorrow. He knows what it's like to be hated by the world. But he also knows what it's like to be hated by brethren. To be hated by brothers and sisters, doesn't he? He can relate to us in the fullest sense. But not only that, it's also comforting to know. And when we read and study the Bible... And we, we understand the truths of the Bible. We understand what the Bible teaches. And this can be on any subject. It's also comforting to know that when you stand for the Bible, when you stand for God's truth, that we have a just God that will someday, someday make things right. Whether it's in this world, whether it's in the world to come. But it's comforting to know that that same mediator, that that same high priest that can relate to me and he knows what it's like, he's been through those types of situations, he says, they may think that they're doing the right thing. They may think, they said, hey, let the Lord be glorified, but I'm going to appear to your joy. I'm actually going to appear and help you. And you know what? He says, they're the ones that's going to be ashamed. I'm happy that I have a God that can relate to me that can relate to the hard times that I've been through, that you've been through. You can pray to him. He knows exactly what it's like. And everything that you've went through over the past year, two years, God promises in his word, if you believe it, he says that that will not go unrewarded, that it will be rewarded. And what greater thing to stand for than the name of Jesus? Amen. I mean, what greater thing in, the, in this world? If I had to pick one thing that God said, hey, you got one choice. Hang your hat upon this. I'm hanging my hat on the name of Jesus. Is what I'm hanging my hat on. Amen. I'm hanging my hat on exalting and boasting the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. And it says one more time: Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at His word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out. Which, watch, what he, watch what he says right here. For my name's sake, said. Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. So notice the speech right there. That cast you out for my name's sake. 
where we read earlier, Matthew chapter number 5. He says this, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. And then he says this, for my sake. Who's speaking? Jesus. You know who's speaking in Isaiah? The soon to be born, Jesus. Standing for the name of Jesus is the greatest thing you could ever do. Don't ever have any regrets about that. Don't ever have any regrets about what you did. And you know why? You have a companion with him forevermore, number one. And number two, what you've done will not go unrewarded. You should leap for joy when you have the opportunity to be persecuted, whether by the world or by brethren. Just make sure you're doing the right thing when you're being persecuted. But you should leap for joy when you're being persecuted and being falsely labeled and falsely lied about for his name's sake. He will reward you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for being our companion. We thank you.